So welcome everybody. This is the Microsoft 365 and Power Platform a Community Call. Today is January 9th, 2024, and this is we're back with the with the weekly Tuesday call every single Tuesday at 8 a.m. Pacific time. We have this call, and in this call we always have Microsoft speakers, with certain exceptions every now and then, but typically they are Microsoft uh, speakers. And we really want to have the Microsoft BMs and engineers and cloud advocates to tell you the latest and greatest what are the possible within the Microsoft 365 and Power Platform. Now, before we go to the actual agenda of today, uh, we wanted to call out uh, congratulations for all of the new Microsoft uh, Most Valuable uh, people. And uh, today there was a announcement uh, crawling in and quite a few people actually within this call uh, got also nominated, well, not nominated, awarded with the Microsoft uh, Most Valuable Professional. Uh, uh, what is it? Is it a award? David, help me. Award. Award. Okay, we'll call it as an award. Yes, exactly. Cool. Um, but yeah, congratulations there. We do have 30, 30 new uh, Microsoft 365 uh, MVPs, and we did have 30 new uh, Power Platform or Business Application MVPs getting announced at uh, this time. Uh, we, by the way, I, I at least personally, we, we try to avoid on actually saying those names because there's a privacy concerns related on that. So all of the MVPs have received their MV, uh, invite and email, and they will share that their MVPs within LinkedIn and social media as they want. So we don't intentionally want to call them out because there might be some people who don't want to be called out. Um, there's a certain uh, rules over there. Now, why would you be an MVP and don't want to that to be called out. That's a separate discussion. Anyway, everybody can do whatever they want. Now, let's go to the actual call of the day. Uh, so, We'll start with a typical recap of the, all of the assets and, and the stuff which you have available to get started on Microsoft 365 Power Platform side. This time, uh, all of the topics are more on the Microsoft 365 side. Actually, even all of the news are on the Microsoft 365. Uh, it seems to be that Power Platform had a bit of a longer uh, holiday season, uh, so there's not even new news at this moment of a time, but I'm pretty sure that that's going to change uh, by next week. So we're going to start it's with a, up, a We're update. just powering it up for everybody. <laughs> You're it. powering up. Thank you, David. Uh, so we're going to start with a new and typical assets which are available, and then we move to the actual demos of today. Well, before that, we'll have to get a mode picture, and then we go to the actual demos of today. And Carrie and Waldeck is going to start by a story on extending co-pilot with Microsoft 365. Uh, this is a new series which is starting with in today and this series is roughly 10 to 15 to 20 uh, episodes so you will have a weekly coverage of new stuff related on copilot and copilot extensibility and, and more details every single week which is really really cool the second demo of today is john miller uh, talking about what's new in the microsoft uh, teams toolkit this was actually scheduled already for december but there was a, a a unfortunate cancellation at the time but john is now back and we kind of covered that there and then kasif and nick uh, simmons are going to go cover build collaboration apps quickly it Microsoft 365 and SharePoint embedded with Fluid Framework 2.0, which, by the way, just got announced to be in the beta um, uh, yesterday. Uh, so timing is perfect. So you are really seeing the latest and greatest, which is available for you in public beta uh, since yesterday. Awesome, awesome stuff to get, uh, get moving as well. Now, before we go to the demos, uh, so uh, we do have to go a set of slides and assets which are available for you to take advantage. We have the YouTube channel. Uh, all of the community call recordings and demos are getting published over there. You cannot ac access the recording directly from the chat, even though it kind of implies that you can, but that's not the case. Within 24 hours, all of the recordings are getting published within that YouTube channel. We also publish every single business day a new uh, video within that channel as of the new content all the time. You want to subscribe, you'll stay up to date on what's happening. We do have LinkedIn group for discussions and updates within a LinkedIn, a great way of staying up to date on and sharing your findings and cool stuff uh, with the community. There's more than 1,500 people already there. It's growing all the time, which is great. We have a lot of open source assets available in the GitHub, but it, as it might be a bit difficult to find a relevant sample for you because there's so many repos, so many organizations, so many things in GitHub. We do have these sample galleries and primary gallery, gal gallery is at AKMS Community Samples. Uh, from there, you can actually find, uh, use a simple search query based uh, uh, search uh, to find a relevant sample for you. There's more than 1800, close to 1800 samples available from that one centralized location. We do have a lot of URLs, a lot of assets, all of that stuff. Go to the AKMS Community uh, forward slash home to find all of the things which are available for you to take advantage. Now, we do have a lot of these community calls. You are in one of these calls, so you're kind of familiar with what's happening. We do have other calls as well. So every single Tuesday, 
say 8 a.m. Pacific time is this call, which is with Microsoft presenters. On top of that, we have the monthly Power Platform uh, community call, which is typically with community presenters. Then we have the monthly Office add-ins call happening actually this week, which is typically with the Microsoft presenters. And then we have the 7 a.m. 7 a.m. Uh, Thursday series, 7 a.m. Pacific time on every single Thursday. It's either the Microsoft 365 and Power Platform community call or Viva Connection and SharePoint Framework community call. Within those calls, typically the demos are done by the community members, which is really, really cool. We really, really want the community to show what they built. So typically what happens is even the Microsoft people are like, wow, I never thought about that people would actually build this cool stuff. And that's why we invite every single one within the call, uh, within this course and within the community. If you build anything cool, if you have learnings, if you test out a new feature, it doesn't have to be a solution or custom open source stuff. You tested out some new functionality within SharePoint Online, within Power Platform, within Power Automate, and you'll be like, oh, that's really cool. Let me show this uh, for the other people in the community. Those demos are absolutely welcome. The easiest way to actually get signed up is to go to the AKMS Community Request Demo, and we will get you scheduled within upcoming community calls. So really, really cool opportunity for everybody. And by the way, coming back on the MVP statements where we started, it, this, all of these demos do count. So they are really, really great way of getting MVP status if you're really looking into get, getting uh, moving on that side as well. Now, we do have a lot of assets available to getting started on Microsoft Cloud, so we, you can subscribe to Microsoft 365 Developer Program. You will get a free E5 Developer Tenant with 25 accounts, which is awesome, and it will automatically renew every single 90 days as long as you use it for developer purposes. And a lot of, lot of material in the learn.microsoft.com related on learning modules. We also have individual shows available for you. Uh, our weekly show with PMP Weekly, that's in the name. It happens every single week uh, with me and Waldeck Mastercards, with, where we typically interview some of the MVPs or Microsoft employees on their career and what's happening and what they have done in the past and what they're planning to do in the future. On top of that, we have the Mondays at Microsoft with Karan and Heather, really awesome show happening within YouTube and in LinkedIn, uh, live streaming together with them. And they're walking always through on, on what's happening within the Microsoft community side as well. And then on top of this, we have the Microsoft 365 podcast. I just double checked the site and they have not been super active recently, but I did hear, heard rumors that Jeremy Fake and the and the uh, drivers of this show are starting to ramp it up again. So we would have new episodes coming up within the spring. I can confirm, we'll confirm that for the next week, hopefully. Now, uh, we already mentioned that there's a lot of samples available. We are at 1,790 samples um, at AKMS Community Samples. So don't start from scratch. Go to this one location, use the search query, look for the samples which are doing something close what you're looking into implementing and get the sample from the, uh, from the gallery or have a look on the code. Uh, have a look on if you're blocked on doing something. Go here, try to find a sample and, and examples how to get started, and then you will hopefully get you unblocked what, on whatever you are building. Now, as to find a sample, you might be wondering, on, okay, I'm in GitHub. How do I? Wait, I don't know. How does this GitHub work? And that's why we have David Warner and Sharing is Caring uh, initiative with other community members, uh, which David can do a quick intro of what this is all about. Absolutely. Thank you, Vesa. <laughs> New year, new opportunities, everybody. So we're excited. We are going to be launching our office hours starting this week. Be on the lookout for that. Uh, we know that there's been some holes in the uh, scheduling for all this, but we're working on scaling it, getting more people involved. Plenty of opportunity, like Vesa said, to learn more on how you can get involved in the community. These are live sessions, safe space, which means we do not record them. So you can feel free to ask any and all questions that you would like without fear of it getting recorded. I know how that can be stressful. I feel the same stress. So we want to make it a, sp a safe opportunity for you all. So keep an eye out at aka.ms slash sharing is caring. And then once you do, well, guess what? 2024 brings new badges. So uh, we are ramping up all of our badges again for 2024 with some new opportunities. Uh, and I think if you click there again, Bess, it'll bring in the 20. There we go. Look at that. Appearing out of nowhere. Woo, it's a we planned it. Uh, <laughs> so definitely get opted in. We are almost at a thousand. So could you be the thousand? I bet you could be if you've not already opted in. AK.ms slash community slash recognition. Powered by Credly. Absolutely free of charge. So get onto those keyboards. Start typing away. Get opted in. Get recognized. They can be added to your LinkedIn profile, your Twitter profile, your blogs, all the things that you want to share with the community. So thank you all for uh, an amazing 2023. Let's make 2024 even better. Vesa, back to you in Finland.
Excellent. Thank you, David, from LA. Now, let's move into a quick section related on all of the big events that are happening within this year. So our bigger, the first big event is the Microsoft 365 conference happening within Orlando, starting from April 13th, May 1st and 2nd. So those are the actual conference days. There are pre-conference workshops happening actually Sunday and Monday uh, before and then Friday after the conference as well. And a lot of, lot of great uh, information, a lot of Microsoft speakers and, and community speakers. The speakers were just announced uh, a few weeks ago, I think last week actually, within the site. So go and check it out who's actually speaking there. And there's going to be more promotions around the Microsoft 365 conference pretty, pretty soon. On top of that, we have the European Collaboration Summit happening in 14th through 16th in May uh, 2024 in Wiesbaden, basically in Frankfurt. Uh, Wiesbaden is one of the, the cities right next to the Frankfurt or right next to the Frankfurt airport. So it's a super convenient location if you're based in Europe to fly in and meet other community members. Last year, there was uh, two 200 and 2,500 people within this conference, and, and it really focuses on the Microsoft 365 and Power Platform. A lot of, lot of engagement opportunities there. We also have the TechCon 365. Not sure if you noticed, uh, Educon was renamed to be a TechCon 365 uh, for this year. Um, uh, so the Educon name apparently referenced to made it much on the education, so it was clarified to be TechCon 365. So Microsoft 365 Power Platform conferences in Seattle, DC, and Dallas uh, in June, August, and November. You want to check those out as well at techcon365.com. And then uh, in the autumn, we also have the Power Platform uh, Conference uh, 2024 happening in Las Vegas uh, at September 18th to 20. And there's some workshops over there as well. So great, great, great opportunities of meeting up the community. Uh, feel free to join, well, maybe all of them, uh, depending on your opportunity on, on travel. On double dose, we do have a lot of, lot of um, uh, smaller events happening all around the world. So you don't have to travel. You are not going to miss out from the community. There are local community events. Some of them might have a cost. Most of them are free. So you can actually uh, meet the other community members all around the world, from France to US, for Nigeria to Tallinn in Estonia, and so on. And New Zealand is the last one, what we're actually seeing on a page. So a lot of, lot of different events. If you go to communitydays.org, you'll find all of these events from one centralized location. Now, as we started, I mentioned that there isn't actually that much news on the Power Platform side, but there was some news on the Microsoft 365 side, and these are all listed in here. Thank you, David, pasting them on the chat as well. So uh, updates on the Microsoft Teams and, and SharePoint on the monthly updates uh, and some of the new updates on the developer side. I'm not going to deep dive in here, just to call out announcement of Fluid Framework 2.0 beta on the developer side, because that's the demo of the day as the last demo on the, within the agenda. Really, really cool uh, to see that one live immediately after that announcement, which happened yesterday. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, before we go to the actual stars then of the day, let's do a quick group photo uh, on, on with all of the attendees. So if you enable your camera, you will be visible within here. And we do a uh, record a GIF animation out of this. We do have 50 seats within the room. I can see Nico. I can see uh, Simon. Uh, I can oh, there's a lot of Xiao in, in the front row as well. A lot of familiar faces. Ra Rachel there, congratulations for your MVP. That was really, really cool. Yes, that's that's good way of dancing. Uh, let's wait a few more seconds uh, or 10 seconds. David is already warming up on the back row as well. That's good, good, good. Starting to dance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Few more seats, few more seats. Go, Gary. Gary is showing example. And we will start the recording. Three, two, one, three, two, one. And let's do some hand waving, everybody. We'll grab a GIF animation out of this. Excellent. And it's not pixelated today. So that's really, really cool. We can actually see all of the smiling faces and recognize all of the people. This is really, really cool. That's awesome, a new awesome. fiber in Finland, man. That's a new fiber. <laughs> yes. Excellent. Thank you, Fabian. Not yet on my house, unfortunately. It's <laughs> it's a really long, long, long running joke at this moment of a time. Thanks, everybody. We'll grab a GIF animation out of that. It's really, really cool. Cool. Then we go to the actual stars of the day. So we'll start with Gary and Waldeck uh, with the co-pilot extensibility. We move to John Miller and then not uh, the last but definitely not the least is Kashif and Nick is going to talk about the fluid framework. Everybody has 15 minutes. We are right on the schedule. Gary Waldeck, take it away. Thank you, Vesa. Hopefully you can hear me all well. Um, yep. Waldeck, hopefully he's on the call. I'm here. <laughs> hey, we're here. Great. Everyone's here. Right. Let me share my deck. Uh, share screen. Uh, let me know if you can see that. Yep. All good. 
Oh, good. Uh, yeah, the top bars moving. Okay, so um, welcome everyone. So today's session is going to be extending Copilot for Microsoft 365. Uh, it's different to the session that I was planning to do. That's going to be done next week. So if you're coming for just plugins, um, that's coming next week. We're going to do a quick overview today. Myself, Gary Trinder, I'm a cloud developer advocate at Microsoft, and uh, I have with me today Baldek. Introduce yourself. Hi everybody, I'm Valik, and I am also a cloud, cloud developer advocate at Microsoft. And we're going to basically go through uh, why you would want to extend Copilot for Microsoft 365, what you get out of the box, and the different options that you've got available to you um, as well. And as Vase mentioned, this is going to be a series. We're going to dive a lot deeper than we are uh, going to today over the coming weeks. Um, so, um, and, and also, if you are um, looking at Copilot, maybe you've not got Copilot at the moment, and um, it's still relevant. We're going to talk a lot about things that are going to be relevant to Teams uh, and Outlook, um, as well as Copilot. So we're going to learn a lot of things as we go through this, um, as uh, as 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 Copilot, uh, you know, uh, gets more and, and and more interesting as as we see uh, things happening with it. So let's have a quick. Um, recap of what is Microsoft Copilot for Microsoft 365. Well, it is an AI powered productivity tool and it's using these large language models like we've seen with ChatGPT, but it's integrated with your data, your company data through Microsoft Graph and you can access um, you know, this, this company data and use the, uh, the power of the large language models through different Microsoft uh, 365 apps. And if we're going to look at Copilot for Microsoft 365 in its entirety, it's actually made up of lots of, of, of different elements, lots of copilots, right? Uh, so we've got copilots that are relevant to the applications that you use on a daily basis. So we've got, you know, uh, spending time in Teams and Outlook and Word, PowerPoint. You know, we're building documents, we're writing, uh, sorry, we're building uh, slideshows. Uh, presentations, uh, we're having meetings. And these in-app kind of co-pilots are there and specialized for um, for specific use cases. Like, you know, I want to start a, a new document. And I don't want to start from a blank page. Uh, and same with the, the PowerPoint. Or I want to summarize an, an email, for example, of a recap on a meeting. So there's lots of these in uh, uh, kind of in-app co-pilots. And the one that's sticking out here is Microsoft 365 Chat, which isn't specific to a particular app. So Microsoft 365 Chat is a, a place where um, you, know, you can go and have conversations with you know, your business data, ask questions uh, about your, your company data and get answers. Um, and Microsoft 365 Chat uh, is available in Teams as an app. It's available in Office.com as an app as well. Um, and it's actually available through uh, Bing.com uh, as well. So if you go to uh, Bing.com slash chat, you'll see that you have the, uh, the, the the normal chat experience, but you've also got the, the, the work experience as well. And that's all Microsoft 365 Chat. This is your interface to ask questions, um, uh, get answers uh, ab about your, your company um, data. And this is relevant in terms of talking about extensibility as well. So when we're talking about extensibility, we are specifically talking about Microsoft 365 chat um, at this moment in time. So what happens when you're using Microsoft 365 chat? You've put in a, a prompt what's happening behind the scenes well when you're asking questions um the uh, microsoft 365 chat and, and copilot uh, is using the semantic index for copilot to uh, basically gather the the data the insights do the reasoning um on on your on your prompt on your questions so that it can you know go away find relevant information uh, using Microsoft Graph um, about your about your organization then present that that back to you so when Microsoft 365 chat is running in the background it's it's really using the semantic index um, to to gather that that information and it's it's you need to understand what's included in the index to really understand okay well why would I want to extend this as well so 
This is the currently the content types that are available index in the semantic index. And we can see that we've got mailboxes, we've got some SharePoint data, we've got documents, right? We've got Word documents, PowerPoint, PDFs um, as well. Um, and, and we've also got some external data as well through uh, graph connector data, which we'll get onto a little bit later. But currently this is the, 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 the data that is available to um, now, Microsoft 365 chat uh, when the prompt is, is sent through to to actually return uh, relevant uh, information. And with that, I'm going to hand over to Waldeck, who's going to talk about, well, why would you want to extend this? You know, you're getting a lot of things out of the box. Um, so Waldeck, do you want to take over? Absolutely. Absolutely. Right. So you you did, you did a great a great job explaining what are different things you get out of the box and we've already seen right like copilot is available across different experiences that, that we've got a part of that are a part of uh microsoft 365 and like you've seen in 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 the table that we have just seen that there's a bunch of stuff in there already but not everything right when you, th you think about it what is it that you get out of the box well you get lm you get a large language model with which you can chat and you, and it knows things based of the the material that was included in when it was uh learned and created one two there are uh things that are available to you out of the box are some of the things that are a part of the microsoft graph specifically a part of the semantic index and that was again all the different things in a table what do you miss well to start with all the line of business apps that you use in your work, whether that's Jira or Trello or Miro or Salesforce or SAP or whatever else that it is that you use in your work that isn't a part of Microsoft 365, you will not be able, like Microsoft uh, 365 chat will not, not know anything about that, right? So one, two, there are things on Microsoft Graph that aren't a part of, of the sem semantic index, right? So you will miss that thing too, right? And also, and one uh, one more thing, everything uh, else that is out there on the internet. So you will not have access to that too. So why would you want to have that? TLDR, like to make it really short, you want AI to be able to reason over all the data in your org all the data that you use for your work to accomplish your task. You want it to be, you know, as smart as you are. You want it to know everything that you know so that it can be va 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 valuable. Like, it, yeah, like you, 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 you don't want it to just be a gimmick, a gadget. You want it to be meaningful assistant. And with that, you need to give it access to all information in your org. That's exactly why you need to think about extending it. When you think about it, there are, uh, Gary, next slide, please. There are two different ways, like when you think about like different ways in which you can extend it, there are two ways that you can go about it. So one is you can bring the content, your external content, content that isn't on Microsoft 365, to Microsoft 365 through the Microsoft Graph Connectors. You basically ingest the content in, and from that point, it becomes available to uh, uh, the N365 chat experiences, one. Right. Two, another option is to have it available on runtime through a plugin. Right. So basically you build a plugin, register it. And at that point, Microsoft 365 chat will know like, hey, I have a plugin available that matches the user's prompt. Let me use it on runtime, real time. You know, reach out to it, have that call the external system where the content is stored and bring it back and include it as a part of the answer that LLM will then build to the user. So there are two different ways and they have their, you know, they're each pros and cons, cons, there are caveats to it. But the most important part is you've got two options that, and you will choose uh, one of them, either of them, depending on scenario uh, that you want to accomplish. But first things first, let's see how they work in action. Gary, over to you. Thank you, Waldeck. Okay, let's take a look at Copilot in action. Hopefully, yeah, we can actually see that. So here I have M365 chat. Um, I'm going to show you now how, uh, from a user perspective, a user can use a plugin to access uh, data in an external system. So we have a little uh, plugin tray in here, and we've got an enablement. So with the plugin, you have to enable it. Um, 
based on on the prompt so you can turn them on and off based on what you want to ask questions about and um, so i have a contoso products uh plug in here it's basically a, a product catalog uh, lookup data is uh, actually stored in in sharepoint as list items um so i can enable my plugin and i and i can ask uh copilot to uh find me information so i'm going to send in this prompt at the moment so i'm going to get some information about a specific product okay i'm looking for contoso quad um, and this is going to return me a a single result and this is copilot basically understanding that it can use a plugin to go and get the data yes it's found a result so we've got contoso quad and uh, our plugin can actually inject like a, a a a user experience through an adaptive card this is an adaptive card which was returned with some action buttons in here so if i click on the view button um I, I, it will load up the sharepoint list item from where it actually comes from Let's say I want to edit this in line. I can then click edit and I can get a, a form experience. I can fill this information out here, update it, and then get on with, with my work. So this is, is how a plugin uh, works with this external data and is able to show almost like a custom uh, UI um, to, the, to the end user. And you can, obviously, it's an adaptive card. You can customize this uh, as much as you like. Now let's try another prompt. So this, I'm gonna be a bit more kind of generic here of like find Contoso products aimed at individuals. So it, it's it's kind of, it's gonna bring back more than, than one result. And, um, oh, sorry, one more result from, from my plugin, which means Copilot needs to uh, basically show this in a slightly different way. It gets there. Okay, yeah, so it's found some examples. It's found three different examples here Gimbal Case, Mark 8, uh, uh, the, the Mark 8, and the Mark 8 controller. And we can see here if I hover over the references, we actually get the adaptive card, which was shown um, above, and I get the same actions as well. So I can still do the inline it edits into here. And in the references, uh, it's actually referencing that, you know, this, this data has come from my plugin as well. And that, in a nutshell, is a plugin in action in Microsoft 365 chat. Now, Waldeck mentioned the second uh, uh, example, a uh, second way, sorry, and this is using a graph connector. Okay, so a graph connector, um, you're ingesting the data into Microsoft Graph. The data is already there, so you don't have to go and enable things um, when you, you're, you're working with, with that data. But the 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 graph connector is a, is a connection, and I've I've got a connection already set up, which is just pulling information from some GitHub repos, and we can see that um, data has been ingested. Um, when that loads up, maybe running a little bit slow. Yes, I've got 224 items in there, and I can then um, you know, put in a prompt that's going to return information from that graph connector, and it's going to be slightly uh, slightly different, but it's going to be um, it's going to be in line with with the, uh, the the type of response that we've seen above from the uh, the plugin. Okay, so it's gone away. It's found some um, some some uh, information. It's got the references in here. And if I open the references here, we can see that uh, it's coming externally. Uh, this is from the the graph connector um, that I showed in in the admin dashboard. That's going and getting data from GitHub and ingesting that uh, with a sync into uh, into Microsoft Graph. Okay. Back to Waldeck, who is now going to give you the comparisons. Um, Waldeck, back to you. Absolutely. Absolutely. Right. So as everybody in the world, like you would probably ask us, like, we have two options, when to use which. And the answers aren't really as simple as, again, it depends, right? As a rule of thumb, you can use, at least for now, like when you start thinking about it first time, plugins are, are very well made for real-time data access. Copilot call, calls a plugin, which is basically an API call, right, on real-time whenever it needs access to the data. So in other words, the data is fresh. It's coming directly from system right now. In connectors, you are ingesting them. So how fresh the data is depends on how often do you ingest them and refresh them, right? So that is kind of like the one big um, difference you've got between these two approaches. 
And other one is the connectors, right? That you ingest the data into semantic index, which means semantic search is enabled on that, which means you like and you get that for free. So it's specifically it shines in a way when it comes to unstructured da data. Think wikis, documents, big blobs of stuff that you want to ingest. Connectors are made for that. A plugin, you need to build that par parsing searching experience by yourself. On the other hand, if you have data uh, about orders, customers, products, things like CRM, tickets and so forth and so on, that might be actually easier thing to implement in plugin because it's easier for you to find the right things and to make sense out of it because you know these entities. You don't need to explain them to anybody else. You have that already built in in your app, right? And another uh, the difference between the two is is as you've seen in the demo right now, right? It, with a connector, the data is ingested, so you cannot edit it because it's not like you cannot edit the data in graph because you will need to edit it back in the original app. Whereas a plugin, the connection is, is real. So you, you have that ability to modify it through the adaptive cars that are a part of the response that you get from M365 chat. And then eventually when you think about it, if M365 chat is not the only experience where you won't be able to interact with the data, Think about where else would you want to be able to access it because that will also drive which approach you will choose. As we come up close on time, let's move on to the last slide uh, so that you will have the link to more info and be back next week because you will learn way, way more about these uh, the, the different approaches and when to use which. Thanks, Waldek. Yep. So as Waldek mentioned, aka.ms slash extend copilot M365 is where you can get all the information, information about how you can uh, you know, apply for the, the program as well. We've got more sessions coming up uh, next week. We're going to deep a lot, uh, dive a lot deeper into all of this uh, content. So please come back next week and let's learn more about copilot from M365. Uh, Vase, so back to you. Thank you excellent, folks. excellent. Thank you, Gary. Thank you, Waldek. Awesome, awesome stuff. And it's so exciting to see that stuff live and looking forward on the following steps within the series. Now, I can see John on the video and the screen and he's smiling, he's jumping hoops and all of that stuff. Uh, super excited. So, John, it's your turn. Thanks, Vesa. Uh, was I jumping hoops? Jeez. Yes, has yes. Not Didn't anybody like else see, you, see, <laughs> see that? I saw that. So. Okay. <laughs> Very good. All right. So I'm going to talk about what's new in Teams Toolkit. If you're unfamiliar, Teams Toolkit are the developer tools that we've been working on to build apps for Teams, but you can also build these experiences uh, across M365. So you can build uh, plugins like Gary and Waldick just showed uh, for M365 chat. You can build apps for Teams and you can use that shared app manifest uh, to also run an Outlook and you can also create Outlook add-ins. So while it is called Teams Toolkit, I know it's a bit confusing working on that. You can build for lots of different things. Um, so I'm going to show you what's new um, in VS Code and also inside Visual Studio. Uh, so let me share my screen. And since we're on this Teams call, feel free to ask any questions in the chat. Um, I'm not going to show any slides. I'm just going to try and show you some demos. So bear with me if things take a little time uh, to load. But I'm just going to walk you through some of the cool stuff. So it's been a while since I've been in here uh, talking about this. Um, so some things with Team Toolkit that are new. If you don't know how to get it, you can get it uh, for the CLI, which is an NPM package. So you can install it from NPM uh, install. And I think it's called TeamsFX-CLI. Or you can use our VS Code and VS extensions. They have all the same features, plus they help you run and debug and integrate things like tunneling. So if you want to debug your bots, all that's included. So you can get it from the marketplace for VS Code. And once you install it, uh, you get a menu on the left here, and this is how you can start your app project. So you can create a new app here and you get some new templates. So what's new? We have a bunch of new templates. Um, we also have a bunch of new samples and there's a bunch of new features. So I'm gonna try and highlight those. Um, you start kind of with capability based on how you want to start uh, in Teams Toolkit. So you can choose whether you want to start with a bot or a tab or message extension. So you get like the three main capabilities that are across Teams and um, some of the other apps in M365, or you can start with an Outlook add-in if you want. Uh, for 
bots, we have some new, as you might expect, some AI flavored things. So there's an AI chat bot here, an AI system bot. Those are all new templates. Still have um, the old ones we have in here too for creating notification messages or chat commands, uh, more team centric things. Uh, and these also, in, uh, this one, uh, the AI chatbot integrates with the Teams AI library. So I think there's also some uh, previous uh, presentations on using these. And we have some samples that orchestrate them into uh, more full fledged kind of examples of how you might use them. So you can view samples um, over here on the left here and it takes you into our sample gallery. So I'll show you that in a second too. Um, so if you create a new project, uh, VS Code supports JavaScript and TypeScript. If you want to use C Sharp and .NET, then you can use Visual Studio. Uh, I'm just going to create something here so we can see. I'll need to name it something crazy because I have a lot of example projects. So the toolkit will scaffold out everything you need to run one of these apps, including a sample implementation. So that's really what our templates are. They include all the sample code to implement these things, plus kind of our opinions on structuring these projects to help you automate and run them um, easily using uh, the dev tools. So you get an implementation with your example project. So this is a very simple bot, kind of the, the most simple that we have, and it's just an, an echo uh, bot. So if you type something to the bot, it will echo it back inside of Teams. So the implementation is, uh, I think, in this Teamspot and JS file. And let me move this stuff so you can see. So there's just a real simple implementation here to echo out the text that you send. And some of the stuff we've changed over the past year in Teams Toolkit is how we expose what the toolkit does. So that used to be um, pretty magical, and we got a lot of feedback that that was not great. So we've been listening to that over the past year, year and a half, and we've been changing that. And the way we've exposed uh, some more customization now is through these YAML files. So you can see there's three of them in here. And what these do is they express the automation of what the tools do. And you can look through, uh, there's one for local, so that's kind of uh, the way you can figure what the tools do for your F5 or like run and debug scenario. Um, and then there's a special one for this test tool, which I'll show you in a minute. And then there's one for any other configurations that are not local, like if you want to run this thing in Azure. And by default, we we give you some infrastructure templates to host these things in Azure. So we kind of provide like an all-in-one template for running and debugging. And then also if you want to ship it in Azure uh, using bicep templates. So if you just look through the YAML file, you can see what the tools do. Um, this is what I always tell developers if they're getting started with Teams Toolkit. If you're not sure what's going on whenever you press F5 or start debugging, start in the YAML file. The toolkit doesn't do anything um, if it's not expressed in this YAML file. So if I deleted everything inside this provision step, uh, the tools um, aren't going to do anything when you press F5. So all the automation is controlled here. So you have a lot of flexibility with these actions. It's it's orchestrated kind of like a um, a GitHub Actions file or something like that. So you can get a bunch of actions. This one's uh, creates a Teams app. We have these all documented on GitHub and our repo. And then this is the way you can control automation. So you can edit these things. We give you what we think is a good default for the template. So this will create a Teams app. And then all of the things that are generated by the tools are outputted in environment files. So you can see that's what these write to environment files are. So this action outputs um, a Teams app ID because it creates an app ID and so it outputs it to this environment variable, which is Teams app ID. Um, you also need a bot, so we have actions to create bots. We have um, actions to register it with bot framework. This is all stuff you'd normally have to do inside the developer portal um, and maybe the Azure portal if you wanted to use bot service or the bot framework portal if you wanted to use that. Um, you'd have to use Teams developer portal. Um, You'd have to kind of jump through all these things and save these values somehow and then put them in your manifest file. So the toolkit can automate all of that and then save them to um, an environment file so that way you can keep them locally. So it just looks like this. So these things will get filled in when I press F5. And one of the cool things the toolkit does is so you can run locally or you can run in Azure. Um, all this automation is now combined uh, in those environment files and then the tools will give you a single manifest file that you can use across different environments. So we just uh, replace these environment variables. So just have a 
kind of like handlebar um, style syntax for using the manifest file. So if you use these, then the, the tools will attempt to read environment files and replace the values. If you want to hard code stuff here with your IDs, you can do that too. It's just a JSON file. It's just the manifest you're used to, but the tools will recognize if you use this syntax and then you just put in your environment files here. So there's one for the app ID, there's one for the bot ID, and that corresponds to whatever environment I'm trying to run. And the toolkit menu has an environments menu here, so you can kind of debug different environments, and that's how that's uh, controlled. So that gives you a way to keep everything simple. The alternative was to do like, have multiple manifest files, manifest.local, manifest.dev, manifest whatever, and then paste all your values in and try to handle that. So we've tried to make that a little simpler. Um, you can manage your identities and accounts with the tools. Uh, we have a bunch of checks now for checking if side loading is enabled, if you have copilot access. I'm using a dev tenant that does not have copilot access. So you can see that's disabled. So I cannot run um, copilot plugins right now on this tenant. You can use your Azure account. Um, you can separate those things and deploy to Azure if you want. Uh, the samples apparently are not working for me. So I'm not sure what that's about. But normally you can click view samples and you get a gallery. and you can see a bunch of different samples there and filter them. So I'm not sure what I did to break that, but go ahead and try that for yourself and let me know if it doesn't work. And what else is new? I think that might be most of what's new on the VS Code side, um, but I'll show you some. Oh, I wanted to show you the test tool that's new. So something new we've done um, for, I think it's most useful for developers who either want to get started really quick with no accounts, have no M365 account, no Azure account, none of that stuff, um, or you're in a tenant that is very locked down and for some reason you can't create a developer tenant or whatever, you can use the test tool now. And I think I already have it running. Um, so let me bring that up. I have another project over here. I already, I already started it earlier. Um, so you just select debug and test tool and that brings up this browser uh, window, which is basically downloads a, a node package, which is uh, lets you run this project and host your bot. And if you're if you've from, ever heard of the bot emulator, it's similar to that, except for this is very Teams focused and it's part of Teams toolkit now. And so you get kind of a mock up of um, Teams like UI with personal chats, a group chat, a team, or an announcement. So these are kind of the different ways you might interact with a bot inside of teams and this is my bot project running so this is that echo bot running and if i am in a personal chat then it should just echo back whatever i do and the nice thing about this is i didn't need any m365 account i don't need any tenants i don't need any azure stuff i can just click on and run this and it's all running everything is running locally and so you get like instant responses so there's no waiting for the teams relay and all that service stuff to happen so it's much easier to debug very simple things you can also inspect uh, the messages and you would see a lot of the data here is is um it can be mocked and some of it is is what you know in the format that you would typically see inside of teams so you can focus on debugging your code and not necessarily so much of the the platform stuff um, so you can interact with that see what that looks like so you can you know if you were in a group setting you'd have to mention your bots you can see what that looks like and you know it would respond however my team's activity handler does so that's it's a cool way to get started quickly um, other stuff you can do is you can also mock all of the team's activities because this is all running locally you won't actually get real events from teams so this gives you a way to mock all of the team's activity handler stuff so um, you get you know, all the things that you can do inside of group chat, or if you're inside of a team, you get some more options like removing a user, removing a bot. And that would just trigger those events for you. So that way you can respond to them inside of your activity handler. So that's new. And you can also do that um, inside of Visual Studio. So in VS, uh, we've been working on the .NET experience. Let me open, geez, let me open the new project dialog here. And one of the new things we have here is a bunch of uh, new templates. And we have .NET 8 support. Um, last time I was showing, we we're still kind of locked into .NET 6. So in the latest 17.9 previews, we have um, updated most things to .NET 8. So we have a lot of the same templates that you'll see in the JavaScript and TypeScript world. We have the AI chatbot, um, the AI assistance stuff, um, and it's all supported with .NET 8. So I already created this project earlier. And I thought I had it open, but I guess I didn't. Or maybe I closed it. Uh, yeah, I think it's this one. Uh, something else that's new that we have been added into. I have one minute, so I'm going to 
go a little fast. Um, something else that we added in here is a way to preview adaptive cards right inside of um, VS and VS Code. So if you open an adaptive card JSON file, you'll see a preview on the right hand side and you can toggle between different things. And if you um, add a data file here, um, you can, let me just add some data here. This is a title. Sure. Um, get that formatted right. If I save that, then, um, you know, the data uh, stuff works and you can see on the right here, it's all working in there. So it gives you a quick way to uh, preview adaptive cards. And this is all using the latest rendering technology from Teams. That's why we built it is um, Teams adaptive cards tend to render a little differently than the rest of the platform. So we wanted to make sure you got a very accurate preview of that. So that's all built in now to the toolkit. So let me know if you have any questions. I'm happy to answer anything I missed if you've heard about and thanks. Excellent, really awesome stuff. Absolutely great, 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 great new features in both VS Code and, and Visual Studio IDE. Awesome, awesome stuff. Thank you, John, on that one. And then we have Kashif and, and, and Nick ready to go related on the, uh, the great, great, great uh, Fluid Framework 2.0 beta announcement, which went live yesterday. Hey, thanks, Vesa. Uh, can you guys hear me? Yep, all good. Take it away. Awesome. Uh, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever everybody is. And uh, yeah, we're really excited to talk about Fluid Framework today. Um, let me share my screen and we'll get started. Um, okay. Uh, my name is Kash Qureshi. I'm a product manager on the Fluid Framework team, um, and I'm here today with uh, Nick Simons, um, also uh, uh, on the product team uh, for Fluid Framework. Um, so let's talk about building collaborative apps. Um, see if my screen works. There we go. So, so real-time collaboration is expected by default uh, by our users today um, in in uh, you know productivity uh, scenarios. But the problem is that building collaborative experiences that are fast, reliable, scalable, and feel natural to the users is still very hard to do. Um, if you can think of you know multiple users collaborating, what what do you, what do you need to do in order to make that happen? You need to you know take the changes from. Uh, different clients and and uh, move it to the other clients that are in a collaborative session. Um, those changes, um, let's talk about the, the the issues, you know, the changes need to be synchronized and consistent. You have to propagate those changes in real time very, very quickly, move minimal data around, right? You can be moving all the, the, the whole file around uh, on every change. So we need to be mindful of that. Um, and as with anything collaborative, we, we've all used Git, right? So there's conflicts that happen and those need to be resolved. And you need to be very careful when merging those conflicts to not end up in an inconsistent uh, consistent state or end up with data loss. Um, and then, you know, a lot of other things, latency management, net network reliability issues. Uh, you need to make sure all of this is done in a secure and, and you know, uh, data privacy uh, uh, guidelines are met and it's compliant. Uh, so a lot of work that needs to happen under the covers in order to just build uh, something that is so uh, expected by our users today. Um, so, so that's where Fluid Framework comes in. Um, it is a collection of client libraries for storing application data and synchronizing it between clients in real time. And one of the key sort of tenants for us is to make this super simple for you, the developer, to integrate into your applications so you can go from single player to multiplayer with very you know very very few lines of code um and the other tenant for us is to bring um very familiar coding patterns uh to the front end web developers um as part of uh you know offering this functionality um so the way it works is um we give you something called distributed data structures, which are very, very similar to the normal data structures that any web developer um, is, is familiar with uh, uh, using. Uh, you can think of, you know, maps, strings, um, and today we're announcing a new one called Shared Tree DDS. Uh, so you as a, as a developer continue to use these data structures as if you're writing a, you know, non-collaborative uh, local application, um, but Fluid, under the covers is going to synchronize these uh, this data 
to the other clients automatically. Um, so, you know, you built your UI to talk to the data as if it was the local data structure and update the UI on any changes happening to the data. Um, but under the covers, Fluid will take care of propagating those and, you know, merging the, the changes for coming in from remote uh, uh, clients um, and, and, you know, presenting it back to your application. Um, the other you know really cool thing about fluid is it's open source so you can see how fluid is doing it you can contribute to it you can build on it and you know contributions are always always welcome um so here's a high level structure of uh, how fluid is set up you have your client code which is the box in the green at the top that's your application and the fluid framework client library sits within it and then uh, under the covers is is are the service options that we offer um and one key thing to note is you don't have to do anything about the service uh, you don't have to write any code for the service options um it's all you know works out of the box you just configure it connect to it and boom you're you're ready to go uh, and we have multiple offerings in in that space as well um so let's dig into those uh today we offer two primary service options. There's the Azure Fluid Relay. It's been available for um, over a year now. It is Azure hosted, available globally, and you know comes with all of the scale, security, compliance, and reliability that you've come to love and, and uh, expect from, from Azure. Um, and uh, yeah, it's serving millions of customers and millions of sessions every day. So ready to go production for your production scenarios. The other service option that we have is called SharePoint Embedded, uh, and it was very, very recently announced in, and it's in uh, public preview. Um, and it, uh, uh, the, the key difference between the two is in Azure Fluid Relay, your data is stored in, in Azure storage, Azure blobs. Um, with SharePoint Embedded, your data is stored in the M365 tenant of your customers. Um, so, as part of that, you get all of the benefits of security and compliance, and you can have a lot more control over your collaborative data um, that, that's stored um, uh, as part of uh, SharePoint Embedded. Um, and because we're open source, there's always the, you know, build your own fluid service option if, if uh, you shall uh, choose to do so. Um, but, you know, it requires jumping through some, some hoops, obviously, because you will be hosting and managing this service on your own. So Fluid is actually powering a lot of applications with Microsoft today. Um, if you've used the Microsoft Loop application, um, you know it's uh, built on the Fluid technology. Microsoft Whiteboard uh, uses Fluid for their real-time collaboration, um, and uh, Power Platform is also starting to use uh, Fluid, uh, the Fluid technology. And there's you know a bunch of other other, other things that are in in uh, development at the moment. Um, and we've also partnered with external customers like Hexagon and Autodesk and they have utilized and deployed fluid technology in their own applications um and and uh, you know we we love to see the the ecosystem and the community grow around this technology um they some sort of you know mentioned this uh, at the start of the talk fluid firmware 2.0 beta is available now we just launched it yesterday and it's you know ready for you to uh, uh pick up and and use in your in your applications it will become generally available later this summer um, in the build timeframe. Um, and, you know, the two new things that we've introduced, uh, like I mentioned earlier, are ShareTree DDS, which allows you to use very simple intuitive APIs to model your data. Um, and your data can be, you know, uh, like nests of, of data objects, hierarchical, very complex, but we offer simple APIs for you to replicate that data and and be able to uh, to model that data and be able to utilize the collaborative capabilities of Fluid. And the other one is the SharePoint embedded option, which allows you to again use SharePoint embedded to move the deltas changes around and also leverage the M365 storage. Um, you can learn more at aka.ms/fluid. Um, so that's the the first link on the on the left, and then the second one. We would love to hear what the developer community is building. So, 
uh, please reach out to us. Go to aka.ms slash fluid slash connect. Um, and uh, yeah, we can we can help you um, answer any questions and, and you know, love to hear your feedback on on, on using Fluid Framework uh, and trying out the new 2.0 beta. Uh, with that, I'm going to hand it over to Nick uh, to demo, um, uh, to show a demo application and show the code about how it all works. Nick, over to you. Alrighty, I am going to share my screen and share a demo. So let's go ahead. This seems like it work. Okay, so first I'm just going to quickly show you an app. Um, so this application is an app that um, we built using React. Um, it's actually fairly complicated and we do have simpler demos. But I'm just going to duplicate this tab. Um, it says use with one, but that's because there's only one user, um, even though there's two screens. And now what I'm going to do is I'm just going to add some content. Um, and I can add a group, and I can put things in the group, and I can add stuff directly in the group, and you can type on here. And as you can see, when I type over here, it's showing up over there. Um, oh, it just, you can see. So it's a collaborative application, um, and it is using the Fluid Framework to do that. Um, one of the really cool things about this that I really want to stress is that this is obviously it's it, it's built for real time collaboration, but it's also just a really good file IO stack. So if you're using SharePoint embedded, um, once you have Fluid Framework set up, you don't have to think about file IO at all. You've got all the crud you need. You basically create your model, you operate against that model like it's local data structures. And not only is it synced to all the clients, it's also persisted to SharePoint um, in essentially a file inside of SharePoint embedded um, that an admin can can manage, uh, manages permissions just like SharePoint, all the same compliance um, stuff works just like with SharePoint. Um, so, you know, it's, it's actually just a really good way to build web apps. I mean, you can also use it to build not web apps, but web apps are the easiest path to entry. Um, OK, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to quickly show you some code. Um, I have five minutes. Um, so the first thing I want to stress is the app I just showed you is built using the new shared tree data structure. Um, and that shared tree data structure is designed to emulate as closely as possible working with TypeScript um, object models. And so the way you set up an application is, well, first you have to actually connect to Fluid, and I'm, I'm not going to show how to do that, um, but it's not super complicated. Uh, and with SharePoint, it's it's actually really, really simple because you don't need any service endpoint. Um, you can do it entirely client side. With, um, with Azure, you do need to set up some type of authentication service. Uh, in order to manage identity and permissions. That's not something that comes out of the box with Azure Fluid Relay. You need to provide that in, in your application yourself. Um, but that's it. Everything else about Fluid is, is client side, except for the ordering service that Cash talked about. So here we're looking at schema. And what I want to show is the schema of the note object. So if you recall in the demo, there were these little sticky notes um, on the canvas, and those sticky notes are represented in the data structure by this object. It's just called a note. We create a class, we call it note. It extends this special, um, this special basically class um, that's returned by this object method, which is produced by a schema factory, which is defined um, at the top of the screen here. And what that does is it basically injects the fluid magic into what is otherwise a pretty normal class. You identify the um, properties that you want merged, um, or I should say synced and merged up here. Um, this includes, in this case, an array which has special merge semantics. Um, so that manages your ability to vote on notes, which is a feature of the app. And then you can also include um, methods for actually um, encapsulating some of the mutation stuff that you might want to do to this object. So um, there are built in methods for changing um, the data, um, but it's frequently useful to be able to actually collect those together. And you can just add those directly to your class, which makes it super easy to actually use these objects. Um, so I'm just checking time check, got two minutes. So the way we built this essentially is we just built a React app. And so I'm just going to quickly show you one example of how that works. So the the text area of that sticky note has its own React component. And in order to make that work, we pass in um, a note object. 
And all we do when we want to change the text is we just change it. Um, so we do basically we call the update text method, which was defined in the schema, um, and we pass it a new value. And that's it. That's that's all we do. And then with that, every single client gets an event um, which React um, responds to, updates the view, and you have real time collab. Um, and that's it. It's that's the only change you need to make, and everything is persisted to the um, to SharePoint or to the Azure Fluid Relay storage, um, and is synced with every client. And with that, I have one minute left, so I'm gonna I'm gonna call it. Excellent. Thank you, Nick. Really, really cool. And it's so incredibly simple. This is absolutely brilliant. Awesome, awesome stuff. We'll certainly get Nick and uh, Kashif uh, hopefully back on the on the show. We can do a bit more deep dive on some of the samples because that's always super, super useful and get them recorded as well. But we'll talk about that one offline. Thank you, Nick. Thank you, Kashif. Awesome, awesome stuff. Cool to Thanks see so. the, the functionalities. It's really, really cool. Now, as we are closing up, uh, so for next week, uh, we do have the three demos already queued up. So Gary Trinder is going to talk about extending Copilot for Microsoft 365 with plugins. So hands-on experience is building that plugin and actually making it available uh, within the Microsoft 365 Copilot. Grant Archipal is going to talk about approvals kit for Power Platform. That's a really interesting one as well. And then Patrick Rogers is going to talk about exp expanded authentication options for SharePoint site selected permissions and app folders. Super, super exciting uh, function functionality as well. Now, as we're closing up, uh, just a reminder also on our Discord server, we do have more than 1,000 people already actively helping each other in the Discord. So if you are actively in Discord and you prefer this option and this forum, uh, great option to help other people uh, within the community as well. We are also always looking for feedback. So do let us know um, what you liked about this calls, what works, what doesn't work. And if you have ideas or suggestions related on what you would like to see, do let us know as well. Super, super important for us to, to be able to also keep on doing these calls in the future. So please, please, please give us feedback uh, on your uh, on your options, on your on your feelings about this course. So anyway, thank you for this one. Uh, the recording will be available within the YouTube channel within 24 hours. You cannot access the recording directly from the chat, even unless you're a Microsoft employee. Uh, the subscribe to the channel, you will get notified whenever the call is available. The next call, like I said, is in January 16th. And I guess that's it. Thanks everybody. Have a great rest of the week. And if you are interested, do join Office Adding call tomorrow or the Thursday 7 a.m. Pacific time. I think this week we have the Viva Connection and the SharePoint and framework call happening on Thursday. But thanks everybody. Awesome, awesome job, uh, job by the presenters as well. And thank you for lovely chat within the uh, within the discussions and in the chat uh, of the call as well. Thanks everybody. Stay safe. Bye bye.